Greetings all and welcome to my second attempt to begin my series of analysis talks on the movie Fight Club. As some of you found out yesterday, my first attempt was subjected to an instantaneous blanket block by Fox Entertainment. It appears they don't want portions of the movie used here, even in non-monetized reviews. Or so it would seem, despite the fact that there's quite a bit of footage from the film already on YouTube, including reviews. Oh well, I've learned not to bother myself trying to figure out what rules apply to whom these days. Better that I just go ahead and use available still images to do these talks, regretting as I do that it diminishes the quality of the finished product. Moving on, movies are a natural fit for my work. As is known to veteran viewers around here, I'm a big believer in the power of story. Our lives, after all, are a collection of stories some self-authored, some pre-scripted in a variety of ways. And to whatever extent we can take command of the pen, we gain some mastery over the stories yet to unfold. That mastery is available to red pill thinkers in ways inaccessible to the blue pill world. With that, this analysis is a fight club, another of 1999's trifecta of movie classics alongside American Beauty and The Matrix. I should say from the beginning that I have no idea how long this analysis will run. It could be in three parts. It could be in 13. And in all seriousness, it could be 300. This is an amazingly multi-layered story with a choppy, shifting timeline and a lot of moving parts. It is so rich in metaphor and complex analogies that it could easily merit a dissertation. Almost every scene could be the subject of a video, especially where it concerns the red pill angle. And then there is the inescapable matter of the vast difference between the story that the tellers intended to tell and the story they actually told. Those are two very different things. So I will have to ask for your forbearance while I attempt to sift through the complicated tangle of narrative for what matters to the Red Pill audience. First, an important disclaimer. If you're expecting a glowing review of the movie's Red Pill message, you will be disappointed. If so, don't feel alone. I was disappointed too. Watching this movie a few times with a thoughtful analysis in mind gave me a few unpleasant surprises. So with that, we start the film with a foreshadow scene that promises a future of mayhem and destruction and an introduction to our protagonist, played by Edward Norton. He tells us that the impending disaster, like so many disasters, I suppose, has something to do with a woman. Norton's character is known to us only as the narrator. A fittingly nameless individual, he is depressed and chronically sleep-deprived, mired in the mind-numbing, identity-killing redundancy of life on the corporate plantation. With images of corporate culture flooding the screen, we get a fast, unvarnished look at his life of quiet desperation. He clings to the last vestiges of self in obsessive consumerism, adorning his apartment with mail-order junk from an Ikea catalog. We see him sitting on the toilet, flipping through the pages of the catalog like a porn rag. Unable to grasp a sense of core identity, he feebly strives to see himself in his belongings. Anything to create the illusion that he's a real individual, making individual choices that reflect his unique identity. He is seeking redemption and proof that he has not been devoured by the meaninglessness of his life. An interesting footnote to the consumerist imagery was provided post-production by director David Fincher. We're designed to be hunters and we're in a society of shopping, he says. There's nothing to kill anymore. There's nothing to fight, nothing to overcome, nothing to explore. In that societal emasculation, this everyman, the narrator, is created. This idea is buttressed many more times in the movie with the inference that the existential crisis faced by our protagonist and by extension all men 
is one created by men being so successful that they have rendered useless the raw, aggressive masculinity of the past. The film is telling us that we have simply worked ourselves and more pointedly our balls out of a job. So we've immersed ourselves in mindless superficial shopping, much like we see in the long-time default setting of our female counterparts. And certainly Fight Club tackles the darker side of consumerism, but if we just follow Fincher's reductionist thinking, we miss the red pill lessons, as apparently did Fincher himself. Returning to our storyline, however credible the narrator's fixation on things may be, we are informed that it does him little good, and he turns desperately to the medical establishment, seeking drugs to help him sleep. As the narration informs us, he'd prefer a script for very potent two-and-alls or second-alls. The narrator tells the doctor that he is blacking out and coming to in strange places, not knowing how he got there, informing us that something dark has happened, taking over parts of his life. Moving on, the doctor rejects the narrator's plea for drugs and instead suggests valerian root and exercise. He also tells the narrator that if he wants to see real pain, he should visit the support group for men with testicular cancer. This intrigues our narrator. He's drawn to the promise of emotional voyeurism as an escape from the mundane agony of his life. He instantly warms to the idea of experiencing the emotions of others, probably without knowing why. And in hot pursuit of this vicarious catharsis, he takes us to the testicular cancer support group and to the dead-end world of blue pill therapy for men. Now, I think it's easy for most red pill thinkers to see this scene as an elaborate sight gag, a mocking spoof of men in pain in a kick-them-while-they're-down sort of way. After all, in the blue pill world, men getting their balls cut off and crying about it is comedy gold. That aside, I appreciate what the scene is telling us, not only about the self-help movement, but about the state of things for men in a mental health environment tainted by feminism. The scene is a psychodrama of the emotion-obsessed world of women focused on men, or should I say, a black psychocomedy. The huggy-feely, circle-up-and-cry-together mentality, which seldom has anything to do with men's mental health, is on full display here, and it is brought home ingeniously with the help of the supporting role played by Meatloaf, playing the role of Robert Paulson, a former superstar bodybuilder who contracted testicular cancer from steroid abuse. After his castration, his testosterone replacement therapy triggered a spike in estrogen, causing the development of huge breasts, which he offers to the narrator as a place to settle in and cry. Now I ask you, how perfect is that? A big, strapping lumberjack of a man, the picture of toxic masculinity with massive hanging tits and we have the narrator bury his face in them, sobbing about the hopelessness of his life. This moment in the film is epic, revealing a completely new paradigm. It isn't psychotherapy, and it isn't feminism, but a blending of the two. It's psychofeminism, brilliantly depicted, and it is an accurate model of modern mental health treatment, designed for women and inflicted on men by a world in which understanding them is verboten. For at least a fleeting moment, however, it does seem to do the trick. Afterward, the narrator informs us that he is sleeping like a baby. In this metaphor for a society of men without balls, we are introduced to one of the main themes of the movie— It's no coincidence that the film and the novel it was based on were produced during the time that the emasculating effects of feminism were coming into full swing. Even if the makers are baiting us, and probably themselves, with the idea that consumer culture 
is the culprit. I'm pretty certain that the word feminist isn't to be found anywhere in the script, though the trappings of that ideology weave in and out of every scene. It is one of many ways that the movie's makers' blue pill bias stopped the film from making a direct hit on the underlying problem. And this, barely three minutes into the film, including the opening credits, is where I must interrupt with a brief digression. We have also seen very early on our first evidence that the narrator's psyche is on its way to fracturing. In several of the early scenes, we see the near-subliminal insertion of Tyler Durden into the narrator's view of the world. Tyler is our protagonist's involuntary solution, manufactured by his subconscious to disrupt the tedium of his life, to rescue him from the grinding monotony among the countless millions of the working dead. And as we surely learn ahead, any comfort the narrator gets from the gushing emotive milieu of psychofeminism is only an illusion. Tyler is here to stay. Not only that, he won't be content with taking over the host's consciousness part-time, sending him into a temporary dissociative fugue. Tyler is wired for primacy, and as we will see in the next part of this series, he will get it, unleashing a vengeful shitstorm on the world and lending a new vitality to the life of the narrator. And that is it for part one of this series. I'll see you around here for part two in the days ahead. Meanwhile, I'm wishing you and yours a very happy new year. I hope you've enjoyed. We'll see you next time.